Chambers hid out in Florida for a few months, and then he realized that being out of sight might actually be hazardous to his health. The party could kidnap him and kill him, and nobody would know he's gone because nobody knew he was there. His wife would go to the police and say, my husband, Whitaker Chambers, has just vanished, and they'd say, well, prove to me there ever was such a person. Did he have a social security card or a job or a bank account? And strange to say, the safest thing for him to do was to reemerge in public as Whitaker Chambers in the phone book with his name on the door and loads of friends who knew him by his real name and could go to the cops if he disappeared. Chambers returned to the Northeast and established himself openly and began circulating again with his old friends, including Lionel Trilling and Meyer Shapiro. And then in late 39, or, or pardon me, in late 38 or early 39, Chambers did another odd thing. He gave his wife's nephew, who was a Brooklyn lawyer named Nathan Levine, a large brown manila envelope filled with stuff. He told Levine to put it in a safe place and make its contents public if he, Chambers, was ever killed. Now, most lawyers would put it in the firm safe or a safe deposit box, but maybe Levine had the same love of melodrama that Chambers did. He put it instead in the Brooklyn apartment he lived in with his mother in a linen closet that had been a dumb that had been a dumbwaiter shaft in a bathroom. Now in those days Time magazine was the preeminent weekly news magazine in the United States, much more important than it is today. And Chambers had the great luck to be hired by Time as a book reviewer in April 1939. And the head of the Time Life Fortune Sports Illustrated uh, publishing empire Henry Luce soon recognized, as had the communists years earlier, that he had on his hands a journalist of enormous talent. And soon Chambers was editing all the book reviews. By the summer of 42, all the back of the book sections except business. By the time he left time, he was making in today's dollars about $200,000 a year. In 1940, Chambers became an Episcopalian. A year later, he shifted to being a Quaker. In the Quaker meeting, he said he found the experience I've been seeking all my life. Now, at Time, Mazine, at Time Ma Magazine, Chambers was quite a character. Usually, during each week, he would work nonstop for one period of 40 or more hours, living on coffee and cigarettes and taking short naps on the sofa. In late 42 and early 43, he had a complete physical break, breakdown. He went home and lay in bed, not even shaving himself for seven months. In the summer of 44, we're getting towards the end of World War II here, Chambers attained his crowning glory, becoming the editor of all foreign news at time. His politics by this time were frantically anti-Soviet, and there was a revolt among the correspondents in the field, especially in China and Europe, who objected to him editing their dispatches so that they couldn't even recognize them when they were published in time. In late 45 and early 46, Chambers was eased out of the foreign news job and became one of several senior editors. In that job, Chambers wrote articles about the history of the Western world for Life magazine and wrote quite a few cover stories for Time. And this was back when millions and millions of people actually read and studied Time cover stories. He wrote ones about the black singer Marian Anderson, Albert Einstein, James Joyce, the Pope, the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, and the historian Arnold Toynbee. He continued very bizarre behavior. Uh, once in the early 40s, he wanted to get rid of a typewriter that had some bad memories for him, so he left it on a streetcar or a subway in New York City. He carried a pistol uh, in Time magazine. It was not a common male fashion accessory in those days at Time. If you wanted to have lunch with him, on the rare occasion he said yes, you'd leave the building and take a taxi up to Harlem and then the subway down to Battery Park, and then you'd go up to the Far East Side and cross over to the West Side and take a taxi, and you'd wind up about three blocks from the office. Chambers would get out of the cab in front of a restaurant and look both ways and say, it's safe to go in. And he'd insist on sitting with his back to the wall or in a corner. Uh, he moved to a different hotel every night when he was in Manhattan. And the general impression of Chambers in those years among people in the Time Life world was that he was a uh, person of genius level IQ, a great editor, um, awesomely well read, uh, distressingly monomaniacal in his politics, and on matters of personal safety, he was simply psychotic, uh, out of you know out of touch with reality, but just psychotic about that. He had a family life and could hold down a very demanding job. 
His refuge was a 300-acre farm he owned in Westminster, Maryland, northwest of Baltimore. It was worked by him when he was there, and he wasn't writing cover stories for time, and one farmhand. They had 18 cows, 40 head of dairy cattle, six beef cattle, and chickens. Chambers spent the weekends there, and often after he was no longer editing the foreign news and was doing sort of big cover stories, he would do writing there. Sometimes in the Manhattan offices of time, according to Chambers, the faint, order of, the faint odor of farm manure would waft from his shoes. Uh, in New York City, the Carnegie Endowment had an office, and Hiss had an office about five blocks from Chambers, and I wonder if they ever passed in the street or wound up at the same restaurant. Well, let's take a breath for a minute and ask, based on what I've told you, if you knew that there was a factual disagreement between Hiss and Chambers about something that happened between them, or they both witnessed the same accident, and each of them gave a very different version, whom would you trust more, based on what I've told you? Probably Hiss. Or is there something a little bit too perfect, too good to be true about Hiss? And might you say of Chambers, he's obviously incapable of moderation, but my God, the guy's honest. I mean, when he becomes a communist, he doesn't just start reading The Daily Worker. He joins the party and becomes the managing editor of the damn thing. Um, you'll have to see which man is trustworthy, or we will see, because the long arm of fate was about to reach out and bring these men back together again with terrible results for them and their families. In late August 1939, when Chambers had been at time for a few months, he was stunned, along with the rest of the world, to learn that the Soviet Union, which had been the great enemy of the Nazis, that's a lot of people joined the party in this country for that reason, that the Soviet Union had signed a pact with Nazi Germany. This was especially disillusioning for American communists because uh, the Soviet Union had always claimed to be more than just another country. We're a new idea in the history of the world that happens to have just sprouted first in the Soviet Union, and that was a sort of appeal to many people in the, this country. And what the pact showed was that, no, the Soviet Union's just another country that has to look out for its borders. Well, to Chambers, the Nazi-Soviet pact meant more. I suspect he thought, all this stuff I've been giving to the Russians is now going to fall into the hands of Hitler. Oh, my God, what have I done? Well, of course, Chambers being Chambers, I've got to see President Roosevelt. Um, a friend who was a journalist got him in to see an assistant secretary of state named Adolf Burley on the evening of September 2, 1939. Burley had a busy day. That morning, Germany had invaded Poland and World War II had started. Uh, but they had an hours-long conversation under an elm tree on Burley's estate in Rock Creek Park in Washington, lasting beyond midnight. And Chambers revealed the existence of the Ware Group and more. Burley wrote down several pages of notes, apparently after Chambers left, and one bit of his notes states, that towards the bottom of one page, Alger Hiss. Assistant to Sayre, CP, until 1937. Member of the underground comm. Active, question mark, exclamation point. Baltimore boys. Wife Priscilla, socialist. Early days of the New Deal. Now in this presentation or dump to Burley, Chambers did not single out Alger Hiss. He mentioned Alger Hiss's brother, too, and more than a dozen other people in several pages taken up by Burley's notes. Burley's notes also mention aerial site bomb detectors and plans for two super battleships and these obviously, obviously alleged espionage, although not directly in connection with Alger Hiss. Uh, Burley took Chambers' allegation seriously. He had dealt with the Communist Party and he disliked it intensely. And he and others tried to interest President Roosevelt in Chambers' allegations. Um, the others, by the way, included the broadcaster Walter Winchell and the labor leader David Dubinsky. And according to all the accounts, President Roosevelt just brushed them off. Apparently, this was one of his blind spots. He said, you know, communist agents in the State Department? I mean, all those boys went to Harvard. Don't be, don't be silly. According to one account, Burley stopped raising the matter with the president only when the president told Burley to go F yourself. Chambers' interview with Burley, by the way, was the only time that Chambers ever came forward to accuse Hiss. He accused Hiss many other times, but every one of those times, somebody else from the government came to him and said, 
tell us all you know. This was the only time Chambers, active, Chambers took the initiative in making an accusation against Hiss, and it's a time that, made, that it, it made perfect sense for him to uh, do that. Well, in 1940, the FBI was tipped off that Chambers had been in the communist underground, and on the evening, it took them a long time to get around to him, on the evening of May 13, 1942, two FBI agents visited him in his office at time. Uh, he told them about the Ware Group only. He didn't mention the spy ring. Uh, and he said that in the mid-1930s, I was the chief morale officer for a glorified chat room of entry-level bureaucrats and parlor pinks in the New Deal alphabet soup agencies. He described it as part of the American Communist Party, nothing to do with the Soviet Union or the KGB. He mentioned Hiss by name, but mentioned other names and didn't single Hiss out. He mentioned espionage activities, but in a very vague way. Uh, talked about passing documents, but uh, again, didn't mention his. Um, his discussion of espionage was very professorial. It was the party wanted to do this, and the structure was like that, rather than I did this with him and that with her. The FBI agents wrote up a report of their interview with Chambers and said at the end that the guy left the party five years ago, and I'm quoting now, most of his information is either history, hypothesis, or deduction. And next to that in this document, there's a left-handed check mark, and J. Edgar Hoover was left-handed. And that seems to have set the FBI's attitude towards Chambers, that he was a sort of a second-drawer witness, nothing terribly exciting, uh, well past its sell-by date. As the file on Hiss got thicker and thicker, though, in 45 and 46, the FBI came back to Chambers several times, and each of these times he talked more about the people he knew, including Hiss, influencing policy rather than passing any paper to the Soviet Union. Now, before we go farther with these men and their lives, I want to dip into political philosophy very briefly. What was communism, and what made a few Americans become communists? That's the subject of the next video. Uh, if you're not interested in that and you want to keep on going with the action, go on to number five.